have, but we all want to have it in memory of such a wonderful man and wonderful president of the Stop the World Coalition as Tony Benn. I think that deserves a round of applause for Tony Benn. pleasure, in a way, in the House of Commons Library today, Tony's last diaries are there, private right place of new acquisitions of the library, so I've got hold of them so nobody else can avoid them, if you know what I mean. Um, Tony made a massive contribution throughout his life to every cause that he's ever involved with, and tonight's event is meant to be bringing together all the different aspects of his life, but particularly the theme that was in his life from the very beginning one of internationalism, justice, and peace, and that he lived throughout his life. And there's going to be film, there's going to be speeches, there's going to be music. It's designed to be remembering Tony for who he was, for what he was, but above all else, what he said in one of his testaments was that he wanted to be remembered as somebody who gave us hope and gave us inspiration, which he certainly did in bucket loads. So if we could start now, with a clip from the film, Will and Testament, and then I'll introduce the next range of speakers, and then we're going to pass the comparing role around amongst the officers of the Stop the War Coalition. So can we now look onto the screen? Much for all those that put something into that film, and uh, obviously it's a great film, I hope everyone will take a chance to see. Uh, I remember Tony once looking slightly depressed when he cheered up and he came into Parliament. This is long after he'd stopped being an MP. And I said, you look cheerful today. What's happened, Tony? He said, you know what? I was told I was irrelevant last week. And you know what happened today? I got a death threat. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so at last I'm not, my relevance must have returned. Uh, can I now invite Bob Johnson to come onto the stage, who's got to be away to do another gig later on tonight in Maiden. This is all a real Tony Benn type event. Everything rushing around and somebody has to be somewhere else all the time. Melissa, you're next. Um, and uh, Rob is going to sing two of um, Tony's favourite songs. So, where is Rob? I wrote about 20 years ago for Edvard Goldstucker, who was uh, Dubček's private secretary. And Tony always said it was one of his favourite songs, which I was very proud about. <laughs> I met a man nothing could dismay, nor take away his dignity. A man who knew what to and to make and how. Many flowers made the spring. He saw spring crushed in 1939 Beneath the wheels of Germany And walked through all the falling cities somehow Like a sea towards the spring Returning home in 1945 Prague was full of Russian tanks And it was law Two twos of four, only now. It's Joseph Stalin makes the spring. You have to know the difference between the roundabouts and the swings. No matter what the distance, winter turns to spring. Sentenced to death in 1953 for being too much of a socialist. Surprise, surprise, old Stalin dies and somehow still the flowers make the spring. And through the Cold War he studies Kafka and learns like Galileo to tell as much truth as the times allow. Planting seeds towards the spring You have to know the difference Between the roundabouts and the swings No matter what the distance Winter turns to spring 
So when it came in 1968, Wenceslas was glorious. But with the summer, the Russian armor returns to save the people from their spring. I asked him then, in his last exile, how come you're still a socialist? Ask me instead, he said, what two and two make and how. Many flowers make the spring. You have to know the difference between the roundabouts and the swings. No matter what the distance, winter turns to spring. You see, from Prague to Santiago, Belfast to Beijing, underground and undefeated. Winter turns. Winter turns. Winter turns. Winter turns to spring. Tony Ben, he encouraged us, and this is an encouraging song. Uh, he was always good about when I used to see him, he was always, he was always illustrated in history. And you know, once upon, a, once, once upon a time, it would have been impossible to think that women would vote. And once upon a time, it would be impossible to think that Nelson Mandela would be free and apart, it would be ended. So be reasonable and demand the impossible now. You can sing along if you want. Uh, my friend Lloyd Bailey says, Only the defeated don't see. So are you defeated? Charge it, we all say, We are! We are. 
Glastonbury, Dad was an 88-year-old star of the left field in Glastonbury, and they actually wanted to put up a Tony Bennett Tower, too, which is, I think, for a... <laughs> so I, I think, to, a, a, to be fair to him, for a man who thought modern pop music began and ended with the Beatles, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I mean, obviously, at Glastonbury, they, they loved him for his politics, not for his knowledge about music. So um, tonight we're here to share memories and I, I did speak at the funeral and there I talked uh, about him as a father. What a tremendously, he was a great father. He was, um, he set us a very good example. He was very, very hard working and it was, in one way his ageing was quite reassuring because he stopped working every hour that there was. Uh, as a teenager I remember him leaving at he always got up at 6.35 for some reason, and so uh, went to bed at 25 to 1. I was just come back to um, But he just worked and worked and worked. He was um, formidably energetic, he was courteous, he was informal, he was very, very funny. Um, and yeah, he was, and he was always encouraging and kind and curious as a father. So 
That's that's fantastic. The, 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 I was reading, okay, you, sometimes you can't help but read online the things that what I think of as the other side, the media say about him. And um, I read something today in passing where they said that he he was somebody who was a stranger to doubt. And I felt that that electrical impulse of, impulse of fury. I thought, what rubbish. Anybody who knew Dad knew that he was full of self-questioning. He was immensely aware of his own faults and weaknesses. And I think in, that was partly what made him the lovable person that he was. He didn't pretend. And as he got older, he was more and more aware of those things. He also had no real difference between his private face and his public face. Now, I don't know many other politicians, but I guess that some might. But when you... So when, <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean that laden with irony, but I suspect some might. And, uh, you know, if Dad has something rude to say about it, I don't know, a Guardian journalist, not any of the wonderful ones who are going to speak tonight, like Owen Jones, he loved Owen, but any other kind, he would say it in his diary and became almost derided for it. If he had something to say about a new Labour politician, he put it in his diary. And I think that was another reason why people loved to trust him. So look, there were three things I wanted to say very quickly about him that I've been thinking about him, because you know, I've been thinking about him tremendously in the last three months. And there is something about death, that moment where a life ends, and even a life so well documented as his, and he really did have an amazingly well documented life. When it's over, one starts to see it in a different way. And so I've been thinking about him, obviously. And three things I really appreciated and admired of, of him. First of all, he understood the trappings of power and privilege, the workings of power and privilege. But he was never cowed or impressed by them. Um, he always kept a vial of blood, actually, from the peerage case. My brother Hilary found it out there. It's a disgusting looking thing. It's a, it's a, a glass vial and it's sort of a rust colored. But he, he kept it to remind himself, as if we needed it, that both politically and in his blood he was pure red. There was nothing blue about his blood at all. <laughs> that is what rubbish. His father was made a political peer in 1942 to beef up the Labour contingent in the House of Lords. Dad came from a long line of disputatious, diligent Democrats and I'm very glad to continue. I think I, that's what we all need to be and everyone in this room I'm sure is. So he was very, he was very aware of that but the thing he did, he did come from a a, a relative of a privileged background, but he used it. He used it to fight for the things he cared about. He used his confidence to do good. And uh, I admired that tremendously. He didn't care about the trappings of power. Another thing that a journalist wrote about, I'm sorry, you're going to find a bit of this because people have written a lot about him, saying that he loved to dine out or something like that. I mean, this was a man who thought a pizza was a great night out. He was not in the slightest bit interested in cars or food or clothes or any of those things. He was interested in ideas and people and doing the right thing. So the second thing about him was he never stopped learning. And you know, he often said that he learned from his experience. And growing up with him, I saw, I would see him come back from a meeting. I remember him coming back from, oh, a trade union meeting where he was the minister at the time and he'd been given a really hard time and he, he could get quite down about things and he would almost change physically. But he would think about it and he would talk about it. It did make our evening suppers, you know, interesting when he was there. And, uh, and he was always learning. He learned from disputatious teenage me about feminism and from my mother. She changed his life tremendously. The minor strike had a huge impact on him. Being a minister had a huge impact on him. So he was always thinking and learning right to the end. Um, and what was I, was, I still can't see what I'm going to say, which is really annoying. But it meant that he, all his causes were sort of intertwined. And so all his campaigns were reinforced by his knowledge of his other campaigns. But obviously peace and justice were at the heart of it. And Joshua and I were thinking a minute ago, we were talking a minute ago about how he could never, to the last day of his life, well, the last week of his life, because he couldn't really speak in the last days of his life, but he could never quote the preamble to the declaration of the United Nations in June 1945. He'd never get to the end of it without crying. 
it, that had been the formative experience of his life. The war, and his brother died at the end of the war. And uh, Joshua knows the, um, he, could, he can quote it off by heart. I must have been distracted by the tears because, because I can't. But, um, you, and I can't read it because it's too dark, but you will all know it. So, now the third thing and final thing I wanted to say uh, that I learned from him was, don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> Our, you know, our, our phone was tapped. I could never have those kind of teenage conversations about whatever you talk about because we always assumed somebody was listening. We had a policeman on the door, although he'd gone to our school and actually ended up sitting with us having cups of tea. Um, we had the media camped outside our house and it was a particularly prolonged and poisonous campaign and it was against him um, and my mother. But it, it, it resonates with anyone who holds a political view or sticks to a principle you're going to be treated in that way. And what I learned from him was the importance of not backing down, of not appeasing your aggressors, but also the importance of not becoming bitter or demoralised. And if you watch the full version of that film, we saw a little bit of it there, that really struck me. I went to see the film about a couple of weeks after he died. And there he is making his case really with, you know, using all his skills and talents and confidence. And I remember that actually at that time he was under tremendous pressure. And, but he, he held it together. He kept saying what he believed. And what, what has happened with time, and time is a wonderful thing in many ways, it shows that those people, all those journalists and editors and proprietors that attacked him, they are shown as the poisonous and, um, the, the uh, wrong ones, and he, by sticking at it and dealing with all the difficult feelings that it gave him, he emerged, I think, victorious, and I'm very proud of him for that. So, look, the final thing I... <laughs> the final thing I want to say is, it, there's something very strange about the death of a loved one, and I'm sure many of you here have had it, it's that sense that they just disappear. One minute they're there, maybe with labor breathing, a long illness, as in his case, and then they're not there. And I've really struggled with that sense of him disappearing. He is no longer there. And yet, as the weeks and months have gone on, and when I was thinking about talking here, I thought, well, of course he hasn't disappeared. And in that sense, he's like everyone, but he's also unusual. He's had such an impact on so many people's lives and I think he will go on for some time having that impact. But also the causes and the, the, the concerns that he had and the struggles he took part in and all the people that he worked with over all those decades, they remember him and he continues to inspire and that famous word of his, he encourages. We will put that on his gravestone. Tony Benn encourages. And of many things I'm proud of about my dad, I'm proud that he is not going to disappear and that he lives on in his spirit. Thank you. very kind about me and John always going to see Tony, but as you say, a lot of it was to get him to go to meetings and demonstrations and all the other things that he did. And I always found him really the sort of activist activist that, you know, as long as he could do anything, he would do it. And he would turn up sometimes hours early for a demonstration and have his little seat that he had, you know, that he made out of the case and his cheese sandwich and his flask of tea and would talk to everybody and that's what he liked doing and that's what people liked doing uh, with him. And I think one of the amazing things about a lot of the obituaries of Tony was that, you know, you'd have thought in a way that he died 30 years ago from the way that many of them talked, it was all about arguments in the Labour Party and so on, which was obviously a very important part of his life. But um, 
I think that the years, the last years of his life, when he did all that campaigning, when he did encourage so many people, in a terrible time of austerity and unemployment and war and all the things that we face in this country and internationally, that he stood up against all of those things. And that is why he was so well loved by millions of people in this country and around the world. And why there is so much, there's been such an outpouring of grief and why, as Melissa says, there have been so many uh, memorials, and I'm sure there'll be many, many more memorials that we don't even know about where people are remembering Tony and will remember him for many years to come. In fact, Kate and I spoke of one by the um, Socialist Historians Group where uh, one of the people on the panel said he'll be like Keir Hardy, and of course, Caroline Ben wrote a very, very good book about Keir Hardy, who was uh, a, a well known Labour left leader in the period before the uh, First World War. And uh, I think it's true that Tony will have a legacy which goes on for a long, long time and people will talk about him in the decades and, uh, and years to come. So tonight we're going to try and bring you the number of people who are going to speak about different aspects of his life and more entertainment and some wine and, uh, and so on in the interval. Uh, but what we want to introduce a couple more speakers now before, before we move on. The first is a man called David Gentleman who's, who's a... Uh, was a good friend of Tony and who, who knew him going right back to the 1960s. And David, as, as many of you will know, is a well-known artist and did many wonderful designs, uh, including the most famous uh, placards that we had from the Stockholm Coalition, those fantastic ones that, uh, uh, with the blood spot on that are so well-known and so much shown in the, in the media. And um, it's rather embarrassing as I introduce him because when David first got in touch with us to say he was against the war and could he help us, our usual response in the Stockholm War office was, oh, we've got another volunteer, let's see if they can go and make placards in the basement. And um, eventually Tony Ben phoned us and said, you know, my friend David Gentleman has been trying to get in touch with you and he's a very, very good designer. Um, and that, we found out, was uh, not, a, uh, not an exaggeration at all. So I'm very, very pleased that David can be here tonight to talk to you about his memories of Tony Bent. Thank you, Joe. I think I'm here because I really did know Tony for a surprisingly long time. I first met him 50 years ago. Um, he'd just become Postmaster General which was a ministerial post in Harold Wilson's cabinet. And one of the first things he did was to write an open letter to the public at large to say, would anybody who thought British stamps could be made better, could they write back to him and tell him how? <laughs> now, I was a uh, young, relatively experienced at the time already. And I, I, but I had done half a dozen stamps and they'd been issued and there were two more sets in the pipeline. So I dared to write back and say that I thought that um, our stamps should be less conventional, less reverential, should have more interesting subjects than they were allowed to have at that time by post office tradition. And also that they should, the Victorian ones at least, should have no queen's head. So I sent this letter off and there was a, um, quite a deafening to me silence for about a month um, from the post office, during which time I think this letter must have been gradually ascending the very hierarchical ranks of the post office, which was an extraordinarily um, formal, almost military run-up, headed in those days by a retired brigadier. Um, but anyway, after a month, to my great surprise, um, a letter came from uh, the Postmaster General saying would I come and meet him in his office. When I, I'd done national service um, about 10 years before that, and it was like a private being uh, told to turn up to speak to the general. I was, um, I didn't know what to expect. As it turned out, can you still hear? Yeah. As it turned out, he had um, in the old post office headquarters at St. Martin's the Grand, 
which were themselves quite spacious, even for the menial levels that I was used to dealing with. But his own uh, uh, room was cavernous, enormous, in splendor. But he was instantly extremely approachable, friendly, natural, and uh, unassuming. And um, he was very easy to talk to. Um, I got the, he didn't say I had all these ideas for myself already, but I think he, uh, some of them he almost certainly had. But anyway, he asked me to do um, uh, an album with a lot of stamps to prove that what I said was a good idea. But the immediate thing to do was that Churchill had just died, and I'd done some designs which the post office had, but he hadn't seen them yet, in which Churchill, who would have been the first commoner ever to appear on a British stamp, um, I thought that he deserved the stamp all to himself. And on my first and um, preferred designs, there was no Queen's head, and all the post office hierarchy was absolutely terrified of the prospect of having to present these to the palace. But to I, um, to his uh, credit, to his courage, Tony, uh, first of all, he got them essay, that means proofs, which the post office hierarchy said would never happen anyway. And then he had them set to show the Queen. And the Queen liked them, but it was conveyed back to him that she uh, preferred to remain on the stamps. <laughs> but, she accepted uh, that it would be in, or it became, in a, an, in a smaller and more formal sense, no longer a photograph, but a little um, silhouette device, which made her uh, much easier to incorporate other, um, alongside other pictures or designs. And that, and many of the, uh, the suggestions that um, came forth in the album um, due to uh, Tony's backing them, and remain in use today. Um, the, uh, how he managed it was um, to bypass the Stamp Advisory Committee, which was also pretty unheard of, and Kenneth Clark, the Kenneth Clark of Civilization, who chaired it, resigned in the process. So, <laughs> So, at least one head did roll. <laughs> um, now, stamps are really no big deal. They're about as tiny a des uh, design as you could get to make. And in a, one sense, they're pretty insignificant. But uh, um, only yesterday I came across an interesting quote from Tony um, on his website which said, and this is, this, these are his words, if the Queen can reject the advice of the Minister on a little thing like a postage stamp, what would happen if she rejected the advice of the Prime Minister on a major matter? If the Crown personally can reject advice, then of course the whole democratic facade turns out to be false. Anyway, I enjoyed my dealings with Tony very much. Um, I, uh, if, um, when I didn't go to meet him in his office, I'd go to Holland Park for breakfast with cornflakes in the basement of his house in Holland Park. And after our discussions were over, we'd go upstairs and meet Caroline, uh, Caroline and Melissa and the boys, who they, were, they seemed to be very young at the time. And I went on seeing uh, Tony um, intermittently for a long time after that. Um, I followed his career with interest and in general I uh, agreed with the things that he said and worked for. Um, but much more recently, when the Iraq war looked as if it was about to, um, to begin, um, I, off my own bat, uh, designed a poster that just said no about as simple as you can, two letters on a poster. Um, but I, didn't, I wasn't sure who to send it to, so I rang Tony up and asked him, and he said, oh, send it to John Reese and stop the war. 
which I did. And I went on to do a lot of designs um, for them ever since, which uh, is um, uh, perhaps the most, uh, uh, the occasion on which I've stuck out most, um, uh, stuck my neck out most in my professional life. Um, and admiration. Um, I, uh, I thought his diaries were wonderful and uh, very revealing and will be a wonderful um, source of information in the future. Um, I, I really think that. Um, I admired uh, his, uh, the, the personal way in which um, he uh, thought out his ideas and then um, meant them when he expanded them. I admired his elegance and, and uh, intelligence, energy and his dedication, his honesty and his candor um, about setbacks. Um, and when uh, in uh, one of his latest books he said that in some respects, in ambitious terms, his life might have been thought to be a failure. Um, it, um, I think that that's the last thing it was because he, he changed the way people think. Yeah. And the opinion, <laughs> the opinion which he drew most criticism for believing those opinions have all, I think, all that I can remember, have all turned out to be right. So, I'm very glad to have known him. I think that most people who met him would have felt the, exactly the same as I do, and I do think that he changed people's minds and will continue to. Thank you. Now the next two speakers I'm going to introduce are both people who are very probably familiar to a lot of you on the uh, political and trade union scene. The first one is uh, Len McCluskey, who's the General Secretary of Unite, and then John McDonnell MP, who's going to speak and as to leave, I think, as we were saying earlier, everybody seems to have to come and go all the time at these meetings, but they're very, very welcome here. So firstly, please uh, give a warm welcome to Len McCluskey. Tony Fred was a member. Thank you uh, very much, Lindsay. And first of all, a huge thank you to Stop the War for organising what is a wonderful event. And um, I think all of us know that these type of events could fill halls right throughout our nation in order to remember with fondness uh, Tommy Benn. Being remembered, of course, comrades, is something all of us would like when that uh, final dark hair and falls, but uh, very few of us will do the type of things that Tony did to be remembered for. Because he was an extraordinary man. My first encounter with Tony Benn was back in 1970 when he encouraged me to join the Labour Party. So, you know, maybe Tony's uh, responsible for that. But I went to see him speak in uh, Wigan uh, and was mesmerised by his oratory and his vision uh, and I had the opportunity to speak to him afterwards. I was a young shop steward on the Liverpool docks and the fact that this man was prepared to talk to me was something interesting because lots of people weren't. And I expressed to him my 
views, my anger about the system and what was happening and what a Labour government should be doing. And he encouraged me to join the party. He said, you have to fight. You have to get in to the party and fight for those beliefs. And I did join the Labour Party and I've been fighting ever since for those beliefs <laughs> with limited success. But the point was that what Tony did was uh, he effectively provided an inspiration. I mean, for me personally, he is the most inspiring individual I've ever met, uh, certainly within the political arena. Never did I dream at that time, as a young shop steward, that uh, one day I could call them my friend, and how privileged I am to be able to do that, because I did become a friend of Tony's. Uh, I, of course, always seen him as a guiding light right throughout my political and indeed industrial life. Uh, and had many opportunities to talk to him and to seek advice. He was a lifelong member of UNITE and of course the Transport and General Workers Union. He was incredibly proud of his union and you know in the latter days of his life when I used to go to see him and sometimes you see it on some of the photographs, there he had his proud UNITE badge on his lapel. Uh, the strange thing about Tony for me is every time I met him, I always wanted to talk about him. Uh, he never wanted to talk about him. He always wanted to talk about other things, what was happening in the union, what particular disputes were taking place. And he was very knowledgeable uh, sometimes. I remember on one occasion, I'm the General Secretary of UNITE, and he asked me about a dispute that was going on that I didn't even know was happening. <laughs> uh, it was slightly embarrassing, I think, I, I think I'll waffle my way through it. But he was the type of individual who listened. Uh, you know, if, if, if some of you haven't seen the, the film Will and Testament, you will get an opportunity. It is fabulous. I was at the, uh, the opening of it, and I was asked a question about, well, you know, how did Tony Benn relate, given his background, how did he relate to young shop stewards from Liverpool? Um, and the only thing I could say is, it was easy. He, he was just one of us. He made you feel at ease, he made you feel important. He made you feel that he was listening to you. You know, as a 19-year-old uh, at that time, um, you know, a child of the revolutionary 60s, we weren't often listened to enough, and he had an ease about it. Not just with me, but I remember him coming to uh, the Liverpool docks on one occasion, a group of uh, predominantly young um, uh, workers met him, and again, he just basically took us in and basically was in our heart with immediate effect. Uh, he had that ability. His political life, of course, has driven many of us and has encouraged many of us. Uh, he has always stood uh, for what he believed, said what he meant, meant what he said. And of course, that's why he was so important to figure. Even his enemies had grudging respect because they knew the man had conviction. And isn't that something that we are so short of within the Labour Party today? I'm delighted. I'm delighted, of course, that we've got at least two, maybe more, but certainly Jeremy and John, who are here, who take after him. Convicted politicians. Conviction and policy. And that's desperately what is needed at the moment, which is what, of course, Tony preached right to the end. It's the need to reconnect with ordinary people. The need to make certain that ordinary people felt that you were on their side. You know, ordinary working people don't ask much. They don't always agree with you. They don't always think you're right about everything. All they want is to believe that you're on their side, fighting for them doing the best for you. That's why Tony Benn was loved so much, revered in the coal fields, the, mine, the mining fields right throughout our, 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 our nations. The Durham Gaul is mining coming up in a month or so. He was absolutely loved because he represented the very spirit and essence 
of the mining communities and working communities right throughout our land. And that was that essence of decency, of community spirit, of solidarity. That's what Tommy Ben was for me. I was delighted when, on his 18th birthday, he received the Frank Cousins Peace Award from our union, the TNG, a highly prestigious award given uh, to very few people, internationally given to people like William Brandt and, of course, Bruce Kent and, and others. And Tony was chosen by our executive to receive the award. And he came to our policy conference and I uh, looked after him and had a chat with him and talked about him. And he said to me, Lenny, how, how long can I speak for? I said, Tony, you can speak all day to this audience. Uh, you know, they're much sooner to listen to you than some of us. So uh, take your time. What do you want to I, I know policy conferences are, are very tight. So would it be OK if I spoke for 15 minutes? And I said, that would be fabulous. So he receives his award to a tumultuous reception from our policy conference. He took his watch off, no notes, of course, and he spoke for 15 minutes exactly. <laughs> and the discipline of the man was also something uh, to behold. In the film, he talked about this issue of the flames of anger and the flames of hope. And for me, I mean, the flames of anger, anger, you know, coming from Liverpool, uh, it's kind of in our DNA. So I, I didn't need much fanning of that flame. But the greatest thing that Tony gave to me and what I'll always remember is the flame of hope because he encapsulated hope here was a man who rose above the vicious personal attacks that were leveled against him by the establishment through the mouthpiece of the media he rose above it like a giant making them look like pigmies he always made certain that he stuck to the issues and the belief and the visions. He always made you believe that even in the most difficult of circumstances, even in the face and the jaws of defeat on occasions, that hope was there, that hope in that indomitable spirit of the human being. And it is that hope that I feel that he carries with all of us here today and many hundreds of thousands of activists. I'm proud to know as a friend, I'm proud of my union that he was such a leading light in it. And I know that all of us, and certainly within Unite, while I have a breath in my life, will carry on his message and fight for a better world, a better Britain, and a peaceful world for all. Thanks very much. very much Lenny Trustee. Now we've got John McDonnell, one of the few Labour MPs along with Jeremy and a handful of others that we can rely on to take the right position on, which isn't always the case with Labour MPs recently I noticed. So a very warm welcome to John McDonnell. Um, I, really, I really like the story from Lindsay about David Gentleman. You know, when he turns up, one of the greatest designers in the world, and we send him to the basement to do our placards. And I say to David, they've only just let me out of the basement. <laughs> and the placards are wonderful. We always use that expression, don't warn, organise, and it's right to the Joe Bill expression. But you know, sometimes you do have to warn. And that week that Tony died was a devastating week, wasn't it? Devastating because we lost Bob as well, Bob Crow as well. We lost. What Bob meant to us was that absolute bulwark against everything that capital and the bosses could throw against us. But always stand strong. What Bob always did, he's never let the, the bastards defeat us, did he? Never did. He always stood up. 
there was a heartbeat for Tony going as well. So some of us did mourn, to be frank. It was devastating. But then we had the various commemorations. And we had one in Parliament. I don't know whether you, you watched that on television. And to be frank, it was all right. And it reads quite well. And a warm word said. But I got about halfway through and I thought, oh, you know, these are people who actually, most of them, opposed and worked against every idea he'd ever promoted, every policy, and every idea he ever stood for. Jeremy, Jeremy was on an international human rights delegation, so he wasn't there. So one of us had to get up, someone had to get up and say, look, what this man's life was about politics. And what did he stand for? And I tried to remind them of what he stood for in the 1980s and that, that thing they called the longest suicide note in history, which is our Labour's program of 1982 which actually was one of the most fundamental statements of socialist principles that you could describe. It basically said, it was his words, it was his words, that fundamental definition where he said, what we're about is an irreversible and fundamental shift. Redistribution in wealth and power in favour of working people. I couldn't define what better about what we're about. And then that manifesto was based upon his words. What did it say? Full, empl full employment for everybody. Everyone who wants to work could work. Nobody living in poverty ever again because we'll redistribute wealth. We'll build homes for everyone to have a decent roof over their heads. There'll be no privatisation of the NHS, there'll be investment in our health services. And we'll have a decent environment in which to live. And a world which, in which we'll live in peace because in that manifesto, one of the insistent things that Tony had was that we would scrap nuclear weapons. That was all the things we That inspired my generation. And in the depths of the 80s, when they were throwing everything at us, fighting the miners' strike, abolition of the GLC, all of Thatcher's policies of privatisation being driven about, the Falklands War. In all of that dark period of struggle, those words inspired us. And they came from Tony Benn. Tony Benn, the teacher. Tony Benn, the proselytizer of socialist ideas. Tony Benn, yes, as he wanted to be remembered, who encouraged us. But more importantly than encouraged us, he actually sustained us throughout that period. And he brought in a new generation convinced by those ideas to then promote those ideas. And he involved himself in every struggle of the last decades in support. No matter what the struggle, he was there. He was always there, on the picket lines, at the public meetings, on the demonstrations. Totally committed and totally reliable. Because this is what he believed in. We talk about conviction politicians. This was a politician who believed in everything he said. But more importantly, he believed in people. At the end of that dark week, on those two deaths, the sun started to break out again. And I thought, this is the inspiration of Tony Benn. Because a number of struggles that were still going on started having victories. Deep Black and Black Triangle, the disabled movement, occupying Atos offices, making sure that Atos is unscrupulous and brutal use of the work capability assessment to brutalise people with disabilities. <laughs> with At the end of that week, the end of that week, the sun broke out. Atos had to give up the contract as a result of the demonstrations by people with disabilities. At the end of that week, at the end of that week, the sun broke out because the cleaners' campaigns in a number of companies won. Royal Opera House tried to undertake the BAFTA awards. The cleaners organised by the IWW said, no, you're not, we're coming out on strike. They got the living wage within two days. <laughs> the sun broke out. It was just inspirational. So now you think, well, what would Tony be telling us now? Well, actually, in all this debate around the role of UKIP in the elections and 
possibly tonight as well, more publicity for them. Tony would be saying this, what it always did. You fight the politics of despair with the politics of hope. That's what you do. You give people hope about the future. You never allow them to divide and rule us, either on grounds of sex, gender, race, whatever. You bring people together and you give them hope. You give them a vision of that new society. That new society that, yes, is spelled out in the 1982 Labour programme. I said in Parliament, what a world we would have had if we listened to him then. But what a world we can create if we listen to him now, of all the policies and ideals that he put forward. Because I believe as he believed, and what he devoted his life to, that fundamentally people are human beings, are charitable. They want to live and work together in peace. They want to share and cooperate. They want to build the world for themselves and for everybody. If we live in peace and harmony and fairness, we have a decent roof over our heads, a health service and jobs. That's the sort of society that he believed we could create, and I believe that as well. So inspired by the words of Tony Fenn, what we should do at all of these commemorations is rededicate ourselves to building that socialist society that he inspired us to dream of. And we do it with the things that he displayed. Courage, determination, and solidarity. Solidarity. Vice President, and we miss him very much indeed. Many of us will know because of his speeches and countless meetings over the last few years, demonstrations and so on, that anti-nuclear was at the heart of his politics and his campaigning commitment. But not everyone knows how far back that commitment dates. In fact, Many CND members are actually shocked to find that Tony was actually involved in anti-nuclear campaigning before CND was even founded. In April 1954, Tony was central to the setting up of the hydrogen bomb national campaign to get rid of hydrogen bombs, and he and others launched a petition. And by the end of that year, in just a few months, that petition had a million signatures on it. That was the extent of Tony's work and dedication with others at that time. And of course, as well as campaigning and organising amongst the people, he fought to get Labour onto an anti-nuclear track. And for a short period, that was successful. However, towards the end of 1957, Labour decided to back the bomb following a very famous speech by Anirin Bevan. As a result of that, in February 1958, the very month that CND was founded, Tony resigned his position as French ben front bench spokesperson on defence, saying that, I cannot, under any circumstances, support a policy which contemplates the use of nuclear weapons. And that commitment continued throughout his life. We mourn his loss in the peace movement and beyond, but he continues as our inspiration. Thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, the well-known and renowned musician and producer, Brian Eno, who is also a great anti-war activist, and it was through attendance and participation in countless demonstrations that the bride became close to Tony Bell. Welcome, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I knew Tony less well than everybody else who's spoken so far, so my comments won't be quite as deep and personal, except for one of them. Um, I, I attended his funeral and in the taxi on the way there, I told the driver I was going to uh, Parliament Square. He said, what's going on there then? And I said, it's Tony Benn's funeral. And he said, 
oh, Tony Benn. The guy had a sort of England flag and so on in front of the cab. And he said, you know, me, I'm a Thatcherite, actually. He said, she's my girl. But Tony Benn, he was something special. And he told, the taxi driver told me a story of how um, some years ago he picked up a Tory peer. He said, I can't remember his name, that long, shabby bugger, you know. As I mentioned a few possibilities, Lord Longford, no? <laughs> couldn't get him. But, um, he said, anyway, he got out of the cab and he said, I haven't got any money with me, can, can you give me your address and I'll post it to you. He said, no, he never posted me the money. <laughs> he said, then a little while later I picked up Tony Benn and uh, I got talking to a lovely bloke, he said, um, and I told him this story. When Tony got out of the cab, he paid the bill and he gave me another tenner to cover for the pier. <laughs> Another similar story, when my father was a postman, um, in fact for 47 years, that was his whole life, he was a postman. And so of course he was a postman when Tony was postmaster general. Now my father, being a rural Suffolk man, voted conservative. Never thought of doing anything different, I don't think. But he really admired Tony Benn. He thought he was a wonderful man and uh, wouldn't hear a bad word said about him. In fact, he stopped subscribing to the Daily Express because they said bad things about Tony Benn. He didn't quite make it to the garden, but he was a step in the right direction. Um, the, the interesting thing I think about Tony is that even though he was so well loved by people, really by lots and lots of people, um, somebody's joining in, um, he wasn't that well loved, as far as I could tell, by politicians who seemed to either think he was ridiculous and anachronistic, or was, um, in fact, a little bit of a wacko, somebody sort of on the edge, you know. Can, can you just see what that is, maybe? I think it's a rehearsal for later. Oh, I see, so, okay. Well, <laughs> Everyone's got to rehearse. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, but I think, I think even to the Labour Party, who, who really should have celebrated him as a, as a once-in-a-generation great human being, they were kind of embarrassed by him. And they were embarrassed by him because they didn't have his conviction and they didn't have his straightness of direction. They had all kind of taken the King's shilling, you know, and he hadn't. Um, and to me, kind of a measure of his stature as a politician is that other politicians, uh, not, not of course the ones speaking here tonight, and not all politicians, but they, I think, kind of avoided him because he made them feel slightly ashamed. He was what they wanted to be if they were good people and had not quite succeeded in becoming. Um, in fact, I was, when I was, uh, before I came here, I was, looking at the um, newspaper reports from that funeral and I was very pleased to see that the Daily Mail still managed to say very nasty things about him. Um, you know, it's, it's quite normal in British society when somebody who's been a bit radical dies, you sort of co-opt them by saying they're really good chaps in the end and they're just part of the rich fabric of British democratic life and so on. But it's a measure of Tony's importance, I think, that the Daily Mail still thinks he's a, a wacko of communist firebrand. <laughs> so the last thing I would say is a, um, a, a small personal story. We, um, when we attended, stop the war meetings together occasionally. Um, we used to take the same bus back. I, I live very close to him. He lives in Holland Park and I live on Ladbroke Grove. And we'd get the 94 bus back and sit on the bus and chat. And these talks were actually never about politics. Um, I don't know why, we just didn't get onto that subject. Um, 
And once we started talking about singing, I have an a cappella singing group, which is open entry. People come and go as they please. And I said, why don't you come along one night, Tony? And he said, well, he said, the only songs I know really are songs about working people and love. <laughs> and I said, well, that pretty much covers our repertoire. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember one of the other conversations we had, we are driving along and chatting about this and that, and he suddenly looked at me quite seriously and he said, why do you think it is that when you get close to your destination, you really want to go to the toilet? <laughs> And he said, and the closer you get, the worse it becomes. <laughs> I said, I know the feeling. It's called an enlarged prostate. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. to a number of times already this evening. He's a great anti-war campaigner, um, but he's going to be speaking this evening in a slightly different capacity, and that's as a historian of the English Civil War, uh, a subject of which he discussed extensively with Tony. So please, tell us about that, John. I'm always, um, I'm always reluctant to correct the chair in a meeting because um, they're going to speak after you. Um, but the first thing to know about the English Civil War is it was in fact, of course, the English Revolution. And, um, and I think um, one of the things that I think was um, most attractive and persuasive about Tony Benn was he was perhaps the politician um, who above all had a sense of history and a commitment to popularising that history uh, for, working, for working people. And I don't think anybody who knows anything uh, about his life can doubt that for a second. The, the writing on the wall first, the, the, the collection of, uh, of radical documents, um, then the, the magnificent uh, show which came out of that that he performed uh, time and time again uh, with Roy Bailey, his commitment to the, the, the Levellers' Day, the annual parade in Burford where the, the Levellers uh, were shot, um, the, the commitment to the charges, to the suffragettes, to making that history a popular uh, a history, to making sure that the, the, the baton of previous generations was passed on to another generation. And I just want to make a couple of points about that sense of history. The first is um, that there is absolutely no point uh, in having that if you aren't at the right place in your time. There is no point in having that sense of history unless you are also in your age where people are resisting and fighting back and organising and trying to change the world. History is uh, a user's guide to the present and to changing uh, the world. And Tony Benn understood that the only point of having that deep sense of history was to enable us to better change the present. The second thing I think that uh, he had um, about a sense of history um, was that it opens you up to something new. Seems strange, doesn't it, to think that the past and the things that we learn from the past is essential uh, to being able to assimilate new things, but it is. One of the things that a study of history gives you is the knowledge that the new occurs. When the levellers began, nobody had ever said that the government ought to be elected by the people and that there didn't ought to be a monarch. When the charges began, nobody else had thought it should sustain a trade union movement. When the suffragettes began, nobody had accomplished women having the vote. And what the sense of history gives you is an openness to the new, and I think that's why Tony Bennett, every time we began something, he was there not for the second meeting, or the third meeting, or the third march, or the fourth march, he was there at the first meeting, he was the igniter, he was a beginner, and he got that, I think, that openness to 
to stop the war coalition when we started, to the People's Assembly uh, when we uh, began it, to the, um, to the Occupy movement, to new forms of struggle. He got that, paradoxically as it might seem, but he got that from his sense of history. So I think that openness is something that he got from his sense of history because, you know, when he said he wanted to be remembered as somebody who inspired us, the question we need to ask is, who inspired him? And the people who inspired him were the generations before that had begun something new and changed the world around them. The final thing I think it gave him, and there will be a lot of people who tonight you know, talk generously because he was a generous uh, person and will remember him as he's now entered the kind of, you know, Brian talked about it, the public consciousness as a, a, as a gentle figure. But he was a tough figure. He was a tough person. And you know, when I first became aware of him in the 70s, he was at the epicenter um, of uh, an unprecedented media campaign. And I remember one day coming back uh, from a Stop the War meeting. It was a long journey back. I was driving back, uh, he and I, um, back from a meeting in Coventry. And I can't remember what preceded this in the conversation. I can't remember what came after it. Um, but it seemed out of the blue that he turned to me and he said, um, do you know what the most powerful word in politics is? So I said, no. He said, yes, no is the most powerful word in politics. <laughs> because when you say no, the other person has to go away and think what they're going to do about it. And I think that sense of toughness, the sense of resilience, of resistance, that we don't have to go along with what's handed down to us from above. I think that came from the sense of history as well. So I recommend to you um, that uh, aspect of Tony Benn's life, to embrace it, to acknowledge it, and to make it part of your lives as well. Because the stronger we are in our knowledge of the past, the stronger we will be committed to change in the present. And I'll leave you with just one thought from 11. Because, um, because we've lost a great leftover, perhaps it's a moment to remember some of the greatest words ever spoken by a leftover. And it was spoken on the scaffold by Richard Rumbold when he was uh, killed for his leftover views, murdered by the state for his leftover views. And he said, No man comes into the world with a saddle on his back, and no man comes into the world booted and spurred to ride it. And when we have a society where that isn't true, we'll have a socialist society. about the great anti-war movement against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq was the diversity of the communities that came together in that great struggle. I'm thinking particularly of the way in which the left and the peace movement, the traditional peace movement, came to work so closely with the Muslim community. And I know that Tony was very dedicated to the diversity of the movement and to working together across the communities. So it's a great pleasure to welcome, as our next speaker, Ismail Patel from Friends of Al-Aqsa. Welcome, Ismail. Thank you very much. And let me start by thanking you for joining us today in Remembering Tony, because I think your presence here is a testimony of his legendary and greatness that invited us. For me, knowing Tony for nearly two decades has been one of the greatest honors. In fact, these two decades also coincide with what he calls his life being dedicated more to politics while he was away from the House of Commons. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about the political structure that we inhabit or live under. And Tony was a legend, and despite the long list of speakers today, I think you will all agree with me and my colleagues that we cannot do justice to his achievement 
nor be able to explore his philosophies and his ideas and goals. But we try, and that, that's what we can do at the moment. For me personally, having Tony besides us in all those marches and demonstrations, and to be a guide, provided a moral legitimacy that what we were doing was correct and right. And that is not a small matter or insignificant, especially when you're living in a state where the powerful and the institutes tell you otherwise. But with Tony on our side, we felt empowered and correct and great. And for that, we totally indebted to Tony. Thank you very much, Tony. was a natural leader, not in the capitalist sense, but in the moral sense. He provided us guidance, he was our teacher, and he was our spirit towards a goal that wanted to see justice and equity throughout the country and the globe. And with the issue of Palestine, to which I'm very close, Tony carved a path of non-violent resistance for the Palestinians to follow. Well before the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement that emerged from Palestine, Tony in 2002 asked the British government to say that if we, the British government, want to take part in peace, then we must call immediately to stop stopping of selling of arms to Israel and boycott Israel and bring it. stand up to the powerful and the mighty and tell them that they were wrong. And this is one of the greatest invitations you can give in the political or human life. And we need to follow that. Now, Tony was a principal person, but he was also extremely astute. When the war on terror took a turn under the guise of humanitarian actions, Tony was very quick to remind us that a century ago, we, our government, bombed Sudan, attacked Sudan, and killed over 11,000 Sudanese at Omdubara. And we, a lot of souls by that time, disguised that by saying this, this was a humanitarian endeavor. Of course, the point Tony was making was very simple. If we now consider that Sudanese attack for what it was, a colonialist enterprise, then today's humanitarian war will be seen as such very soon. And let me say one thing, that while I was saying this, people were mocking him, that this cannot be true. And they were talking heads popping up in our media, saying how wrong we were. But I'm glad to say within his lifetime, it was difficult to find a person who supported that war on Iraq. And this is a sign. I recall in one of the demonstrations walking with Tony hand in hand and he turned around to me and said, look around, isn't that great? I didn't understand what he was asking me to look at and I said, this is the great United Nations he turned around and turned I still didn't understand what he meant. What Tony meant by the United Nations was not an institute of bureaucrats to draw legislations, but a nation of united people a people that are united for a just and peaceful cause, that transcend of all color, creed, and political persuasion, so that we can see justice. This is Tony's United Nation. My friends, those of us who say we love Tony and who have been touched by him, and who consider him as our teacher, it is our moral responsibility to ensure that we bring about that United Nations and we work towards that endeavor and we carry on this torch and pass it on until and ever until that time that we see this globe as united. This is a great... I will just end by saying one thing. That Tony was a person of the people, for the people. And for that, we are grateful for him, and we are grateful for his creator that he brought him in our lifetime so that we could have benefited from him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
think they're also claiming to know Tony and to work closely with him through the anti-war movement. It, it's a great pleasure to welcome the campaigner and activist and political leader of Courage and Principle, Sama Yakub. Thank you. I can't express how deeply honoured I'm here to be here today. This is not just a commemoration, it is a celebration of Tony Blair. And Melissa, Joshua, you must know, you must know that whilst he may appear to have passed on, the fact that he draws this crowd even now, he has not passed on from our hearts and hopefully not neither from our actions. Because I also think tonight should be about that recommitment. There is a lot to be pessimistic about in politics right now. You know, we have austerity, we have the cuts, we have the divide and rule mentality. Gaining momentum, we can see this. The wars have not all ended. But I still take heart from Tony Benn's encouragement and resilience. I've come from Birmingham this evening, we're in the midst of this Trojan horse or Trojan hoax to avoid a limited um, debacle. And yes, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. You know, we're in a situation where a whole generation will be condemned because of the politicking of those who thrive in the politics of fear and division. Whereas what Tony Benn stood for, and what I believe we all here in this hall stand for, is a politics of unity and hope. So there is a dividing line. There is a dividing line. You know, it is easy when someone who reaches the age that Tony did and who gets into that veteran, um, that, that image, that, uh, that, that the mentality that people then say, well, it's no longer that dangerous, you can kind of say positive things about him. But he's always a gritty man. He always had that resolute determination. And I certainly take one of my biggest lessons from his resilience, because he was personally targeted for many, many years. And it was because of his ideas. There are many nice people out there, but they don't necessarily change everything. There are many politicians who can do the final rhetoric, but they're not nice people. Tony Benn was that rare, rare human being who inspired not just thousands, but millions of people around the world. And yet, and yet, in his own character, in his own closest family, lived out those principles, I believe, because that's what I saw. Whenever we met, he was talking about his family. There were a couple of occasions when you know, he was very generous. He'd come up to Birmingham. It wasn't just about, you know, us promise had to trek down to London all the time. He was generous with his time. When he was unwell, because most of the time he'd just get on the train by himself and he'd refuse any offers for, for help or for lifts, but there were a couple of occasions when he wasn't well, but he still didn't let people down. And it would come, it would come down, you know, the kids in the car, and all the way he'd be chatting to them. He'd be asking them questions. He was, I think, one of the greatest teachers, not just of a generation, but many generations. And I know that. And then my kids, they were saying, they're teenagers now, but he'd be holding them in his arms. He showed that kind of interest. And we know how kids were drawn to him. People of every generation were drawn to him. And I was struck at the funeral by how his children spoke about him. And it wasn't just those words that everybody says. That he of course, you know, we show respect and compassion and protect the dignity of those who pass on. But it was very clear the, the close-knit nature of the family. And I want to thank Tony Benn's family for being generous with him so that we could have a share of him because we know it could not have been easy a lot of the time. And it does involve sacrifice when you're balancing family and personal life with a political life. But he made it look easy and that was, I'm sure, in no small part to the generosity and care of his own family. There were many, many demonstrations and public meetings, of course, but one of the ones which really 
resonates with me to this day is when we actually spoke together at one of the Leveners platforms. Because it connected me to a history that I had not felt connected to. I'm a child of an immigrant. Yes, I, I'm grateful for the many privileges and freedoms we have in England. You know, my kids are brought up here. I'm not you know, patriotic in the narrow sense, but um, I'm certainly not ungrateful or unaware of the privileges that we enjoy. But when he relayed the history of the Levellers, and when I was there in person, and you know, the reenactment, and we were at the place where um, these people were killed, and the principles they stood for were commemorated, I think it was that first time I felt actually connected to English history. So I'm grateful to him for reminding me or making me aware of that. But my sense of belonging actually was very much cemented through the anti-war movement, of course, which he played a tremendous, tremendous role in. Because not just now, I mean, I was hoping that that time would pass, but after 9-11, the Muslim community has been somewhat marginalised. And he was one of the brave people who, from the beginning, not when everything became a bit easier, but from the beginning, stood shoulder to shoulder. He demonstrated brotherhood, sisterhood, and solidarity. He gave hope. He gave hope. Where they lost their hope. And he always maintained a positive cheer. That's another thing that always amazed me about him. There's something to be angry about. It's right to be angry you know, at injustice. But he somehow managed to convey this calm as well. You know, and, and I really pay tribute to that characteristic because it was that steady presence which gave confidence and encouragement to so many people. He was able to be personal without making politics personalised. And that's a huge gift, a huge gift, to be able to convey ideas in the most seemingly simple manner. It's a real skill to speak heart to heart and again it's a testament to, to, to his unique blend and unique abilities. He made what other people would consider complicated political theories seem the most obvious and natural thing. Because they are. Because there has been a lot of investment in making the obvious not seem obvious. And making the things that are unjust seem the most natural way. And he exposed that in a consistent way. And he was right. No struggle is isolated. And it's through encounters with Tony Benn and the Stop War Movement with many of the people who are here today that I too began my own personal political journey and I've gained strength from that and it heartens me again to be in the company of those good people who fight the good fight. So tonight is a celebration. As a Muslim, I do believe in the spiritual realm. I don't believe he's totally gone. In our belief, when we remember a dead person, our souls convey that to their soul. We believe that an angel carries the tray of light and says to that person, so-and-so is sending their good wishes, or so-and-so has conveyed this message to you, and that person receives it. I don't feel sorry for Tony. He lived a good life. We are here as witnesses to the fact that he lived a good life. He went in peace because he stood for peace. The challenge now is for us. I bear witness, Tony. You encouraged us. You encouraged me. I hope that I can live up to a fraction of what you stood for. Thank you. and to all the other speakers and performers that we've had on so far this evening. We're coming up to an interval now. Uh, you can get drinks over at the bar. You can give money to the collection, which uh, will be circulating, buckets will be circulating amongst you when we, uh, when we begin. It'll be a 15 minute interval and we need to get started very quickly afterwards. But before we break uh, for the interval, we have one more performance. And, I mean, people have said that 
Tony wasn't necessarily an expert uh, in pop music. But actually, I think that he probably loved it. And I saw him tapping his feet away at any festival and concerts and uh, 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 event that we put on in Trafalgar Square and enjoying it thoroughly. And I think that's because it appealed to his ability and his sense of being able to communicate and always looking to communicate his values and his ideas as widely as possible. And I think it was entirely appropriate, as Melissa said earlier, to see Tony in left field in Glastonbury talking to hundreds and hundreds of young music fans who were completely enthralled by his every word. And that um, told you a great deal about, not just about the man, but about the relevance of the ideas that he promoted so effectively. I think he particularly liked music, pop music, to call it that, when it was angry and when it was political. And that's why we're very, very pleased to have with us tonight Pete and Keith from The Farm, who are featuring Laura Quattro tonight as they sing one of the anthems of political music over the last couple of decades. So give them a big round of applause. Pete and Keith from The Farm and Laura Quattro. Thank you very much. Um, great turnout, absolutely brilliant turnout. Actually, I've got an admission to make. Um, I didn't really like Tony Ben. I absolutely adore the man. <laughs> Inspirational character. The, le the leader the Labour Party never had. Uh, you look back to question time last week. The dumb and down at question time, my dad was talking about it to me. When you think of the 80s when Tony Mann absolutely ruled question time, and everyone always agreed with him in the audience. Absolute thunderous applause. Because basically you could believe in him. You could believe what he said. He wasn't a career politician as such. I'm from Liverpool. And when the Liverpool Labour Council took on the Thatcher government, Tony Benn was there for us. He was always there. Also, you look back to the miners' strike. There wasn't many Labour politicians behind the miners. But let's face it, the miners and Arthur Schuyler and Tony Benn have been proven to be right. But it takes a lot of political conviction. A lot of political conviction to have done what he did because he could have easily been the leader of the Labour Party if he'd have just threw away a few of his principles. But he wasn't going to do that because he was a man of conviction. And I'm really honoured and privileged to be here with Keith and Laura Quattro, who's helped us out. We haven't rehearsed this before. Well, we did this before in the book. We did this in the song. Anyway, this song, this song was written, we went to, me and a couple of lads went to Eeps a couple of weeks ago to see where the Christmas truce happened in 1914. And if anyone knows about the Christmas truce, uh, it was, for me, that was an expression of humanity. It was an expression, a lot of people are commemorating the war, the 100th anniversary. We don't want to comm commemorate wars, we want to commemorate peace. Because that one action, That's what people should be talking about. The fact that Christmas Day in 1914, people laid down their arms, and ordinary people from Germany, ordinary people from uh, Britain, ordinary people from Belgium and France had a commemorative peace for Christmas Day. And they made sure, the hierarchy of both armies made sure it never happened again because it became a court martial offence. So it didn't happen in years after that, not because the spirit wasn't there. It's because they would have been shot at the fire squad. This one's called All Together Now. <laughs> Thank you. 
I just want to say that when I decided to make a documentary about the anti-war protests of 2003, I knew that the first person that I wanted and had to speak to was Tony Benn. Thanks to Melissa, I interviewed him in 2006, and I was lucky enough to interview him two more times. The last time, last summer in Trafalgar Square for the um, Syria rally. He really was an inspiration to me, and it's one of the greatest privileges of my life that I knew him in a small way. This film will be released later this year, and I hope you'll have a chance to uh, see him in it and the role he played in the movement that you all know so well. And um, I hope that we can all carry on with his work. Uh, so here's the two, three minutes. Trailer and this film is going to be shown at the um, Sheffield Documentary Festival a couple of times in the next week if we make it. I'd just like now to introduce two short speakers who are going to speak. They're people who contacted our office and who asked if they could speak about their experiences or one experience they had of Tony Benn. Of course, everybody who ever went anywhere with Tony or was with Tony knew that queues of people would turn up and meet him at meetings if you get stopped in the street. And there are two very interesting stories here. Uh, one is from Mohammed Mabu. Mohammed, could you come up to the uh, to the stage, please? And the other is from John, who is going to talk about his own experiences. I'll, I'll get John to speak first and to, uh, and to explain what it is that he remembers about Tony Benn. Can. Um, I'm so happy to be standing here on the anniversary of my birth, sharing with you a story of my meeting with one of the few men I've ever respected unequivocally, Tony Benn. Um, sorry? Oh, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tony lived his life with great dignity, warmth, compassion, and a deep sense of grace. He was a gentleman, and by this I mean to focus on the two words themselves, gentle and man. What a kind and loving soul, with a passion for the underdog and the tenacity of a lioness on the hunt, when seeking out injustice and calling for justice for the victimized, as well as the victimizers. How I miss him, as do we all. I sent the following to the BBC on the day of Tony's death and passed it on to Hillary to share with Tony's family. As a result, I was honored with an invitation to Tony's funeral. I'm equally honored by being allowed to speak before you this evening. This is what I wrote. I had the privilege of meeting Tony Benn on two occasions. It's the second of these I would like to talk about. Several years ago, I attended a Stop the War fundraising dinner with my wife. When we arrived, Tony sat in a chair outside the restaurant, wrapped up with hat and overcoat and smoking his well-worn pipe, as he so often did. Shortly afterwards, he came in and I approached him to reintroduce myself and offer to buy him a drink. He smiled warmly, but explained that he was a teetotaler. I said that was fine, I'd buy him a soft drink. He smiled a bit sheepishly and asked if I was sure I wanted to do that. But when I brought it over, which felt like a grand privilege to me, he was incredibly grateful. At the end of the meal, I went up to him again and put my hand on his shoulder. I told him that I had seen a Michael Moore film in which he had been interviewed and had explained the purpose of all the miners' lanterns in his home, that they had been given to him as a sign of respect and thanks for miners for the years of support he gave their worthy cause. I told him my grandfather had been a coal miner in Pennsylvania and that I wanted to thank him for all the kindness he had shown miners over the years and his unwavering support. As a man not interested in praise from others, he did not really respond to those words, but suddenly his face lit up and he smiled radiant, radiantly at me, saying softly, you must be very proud of him. I said with a few tears, which are again in my eyes as I write this, yes sir, I am. That is the last encounter I had with this lovely, decent, and humble man who devoted his life to helping others and, like my other hero who died recently, and who I also had the joy of meeting, Pete Seeger, lived by his values. This in an age when compromise to the very soul, core and soul of a man is expected by the corporatocracy and its minions. What a blessing it was to shape the hand of a man such as this, a soul such as this. As David Crosby wrote when Pete passed on, the world is a bit darker now. It is this morning darker still. 
God bless you, my friend. You were and are an angel. I met very few, but how my life was enriched by those brief, glorious encounters. Thank you. Mohammed Mabouf here to come up and speak for a couple of minutes. Mohammed? No? Okay, well, oh, okay, okay. Great. Um, Mohammed Mabouf, I've known personally for nearly 40 years since he was on strike at the Ghana Steak Houses in central London. He joined the TNG then, he's been a union member ever since, and he's got a story to tell you about Tony. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank big rallies, of big, uh, big meetings, big conferences. He also cares for small working people. I was involved with the dispute for recognition of union in 1978. Many of you maybe remember or don't. That was a dispute for recognition of union in catering industry. Where one evening Tony Ben came with his wife, spoke to us and really encouraged us. That was inspiration to carry on. We fight on for 18 months for recognition of union. Then <coughs> also also carry on. Then year 2000 to 2000. Also involved, I was involved with recognition of union again. And I rang him. I said, Tony, we are demonstration outside supermarket in Kendish Town. Would you please come to our, our picket line? He said, Yes, I will come. And he turned up. When he came, only four, four of us were there in the picket line. He joined the picket line, and luckily we had Lord Haler. And, he, and I just explained him dispute, I gave him Lord Haler, and he started to speak. As we were talking, the whole Kentish Stone Road was blocked. <laughs> Market, this employer is anti trade union. <laughs> Believe me or not, next 24 hours that employer came to his knees and spoke to the union and recognized the union. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tony Ben was not, he was a friend of any trade union. He loved the trade union movement and socialist movement. He was friend of all the socialists and trade union. No matter where you come from, what is your color, what is your nationality, what is your belief. He, he was true, truly practicing socialist. What he preached, he practiced. And it's nice to remember him. I hope this organization will carry on remember him every year. He was real, our hero. He was Messiah for all the working people and all the trade union movement. Thank you very much. This needs no introduction, but we don't have time to give him an introduction, but you know him and everybody loves him, it's Michael Rosen. Thank you. In the spirit of Tony Benn, I'd like to read this that I wrote for the 60th anniversary of the National Health Service. These are the hands that touch us first, feel your head, find the pulse, and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin. Change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the saw. These are the hands that burn the swords, give us a jam, throw out sharps, design the land. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, 
make a cast, lock the dose, and touch us last. Thank you. This, one, this one's for Palestine. A family arrived and said that they had papers to prove that his house was theirs. No, no, said the man. My people have always lived here. My father, grandfather, and, and look in the garden. My great-grandfather planted that. No, no, said the family. Look at the documents. There was a stack of them. Where do I start, said the man. No need to read the beginning, they said. Turn to the page marked Promised Land. <laughs> Are they legal, he said. Who wrote them? God, they said. God wrote them. Look, here come his tanks. <laughs> You want a house? You want a flat? You want a mortgage? You want to get on the first rung of the housing ladder? You want to be part of the property-owning democracy? Are you happy that this is what the government is doing for you? Yes! Hurrah for mortgages! Say the zero hour contract workers! And thanks to you, there are now many more of us on zero hour contracts! Jolly good, they say, back to the zero hour contract workers. Thanks to you not having a mortgage, you won't be subprime. You won't trigger a crash. Hurrah for mortgages anyway, say the zero hour contract workers. We love your property owning democracy, even though we're not property owning. We love spending most of what we earn so we can't save to buy our way into your property owning democracy. And thank you, thank you, thank you, David Cameron, for telling us on the Today programme of your thrill that day you walked through the door of your first flat knowing that it was yours. Everyone on zero hour contracts cheering when you said that. I was in France last week at the time of the election and the success of Marine Le Pen from the Front National. And so I wrote this for Tony in a spirit of solidarity, doing what he always told us to do, which is to remember history and also in a spirit of internationalism. I read it first in French and then in English. Marine Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, Madame Le Pen, la raison pourquoi on a donné une étoile jaune. Alors que l'attente de ma père, la raison pourquoi on a demandé qu'il devait attacher une affiche disant « entreprise juive » à leur état de marché, la raison pourquoi ils ont fui de leur asile dans la rue Mélèze à Niort, la raison pourquoi ils se sont réfugiés à Nice, la raison pourquoi on les a arrêtés et on les a, tra on les a transportés à Paris, à Francy, à Auschwitz et à leur mort. Et pour, parce que les officiers de Vichy ont fait un fichier juif des juifs étrangers et l'a donné aux nazis au moment exact que la résistance a dit « Bienvenue aux juifs, bienvenue aux étrangers ». Et c'est ça la raison pourquoi je, veux, je vous dis ces choses, Madame Le Pen. Madame Le Pen, the reason why they gave a yellow star to my father's aunt and uncle, the reason why they told them they had to fix a sign saying Jewish business on their market stall, the reason why they fled from their refuge in the Rue Melaise, in Niort, the reason why they took refuge in Nice, the reason why they were arrested and transported to Paris, Francy, Auschwitz, and to their death is because officials of Vichy made a Jewish document, made a document of Jews, of foreign Jews, and gave it to the Nazis at the exact moment 
that the resistance welcomed Jews and welcomed foreigners. And that is the reason I am telling you these things, Madame Le Pen. Solidarity to you all. is a sort of gallery Tony Benn would be at. He'd be on the platform now, the best save for last. And you'd be sitting here full of anticipation waiting for me to wrap up so we could get on with it and hear from Tony himself. He spent the last few years of his life travelling the country, speaking to meetings like this, full of energy, of unstinting generosity of the passion and conviction that so defined him. And I was privileged to share a platform with him many times before he died. And each time, I'd always start in the same way. I'd say, Tony, you are as much of an inspiration today as you have ever been. And those words are as true now as they were when he was alive. Now, as a movement, as a movement, we remember our leaders for many reasons. We remember them because of affection, because of love. We remember their sacrifices and their commitment. But we remember them for another important reason as well. Because they give us hope. We learn from their examples. We gain perspective from their highs and their lows. Not to be triumphalist and complacent when we enjoy victories and not to be pessimistic and cynical when we suffer defeats. Tony Benn wanted his epitaph, of course, as we all know, to be that he encouraged us. And that's exactly what he did. And I look around this room right now, and I know he is still encouraging us to this very day. I grew up as a socialist in a world of neoliberal triumphalism, of there is no alternative, the end of history, of New Labour with its verbless, meaningless platitudes, forwards, not back. A world where inequality was defended, where Labour politicians lined up with neocon US presidents to invade other countries and bomb and maim and kill. And in that glue, Tony Benn was a light. Unlike others who were seduced by power or demoralised by defeat, he was a man who remained loyal to his convictions. And he gave us all hope with his uncontainable optimism. As he always loved to say, it's the same as time with progress. First they ignore you, then they say you're mad, then dangerous, then there's a pause, and then you can't find anyone who disagrees with you. It is that which drove him on whatever the circumstances, whatever the setbacks. He was a man born into the establishment, a man of impeccable breeding, but as he so eloquently described himself, he was radicalised by power. He experienced being in office, but not in power. He saw the powerful interests, the civil servants, the big businesses that ran the country, behind the scenes, out of sight, unaccountable, as he made the intolerable mistake of trying to abide by the manifesto Labour was elected on in 1974. Tony Benn was demonised at his height, and patronised in his twilight, both for the same reason, to neutralise any threat to the status quo. This was, once upon a time, the most dangerous man in Britain. Ridiculed, isolated, who suffered the Rottweilers of Fleet Street, whose rubbish was emptied by hats, whose children were abused in the street. And then they turned him into a kindly old gentleman, a national treasure to be patronised, stripped, of what he stood for. But his retort was always one of defiance. He said, I'm old, I'm kind, I might be a gentleman, but I'm not harmless. <laughs> now, he understood. He understood that change happens through collective struggle. He placed himself in the traditions of this country 
understanding that change doesn't happen because of the goodwill and generosity of those above, but the struggle and sacrifice of those below. The levellers, the chartists, the suffragettes, the early trade unionists, the peace unions, all of those whose shoulders we all stand on this very evening. And he always said that social change happens because of the burning flame of anger and injustice and the burning flame of hope at a better world. It is our responsibility, it is our duty to keep both flames high. His ideas live on because of necessity. In our country of food banks, of legal loan sharks, of zero hour contracts, of insecurity and fear, this is a necessity that burns. So let's honour his legacy by building a world where all who work have a wage they can live on, where all have a comfortable home they can afford to live in, where all have a job with dignity and security, where workers have rights and a voice and democracy in the workplace, where industries and utilities are banks are run for people's needs, not for profit, and where weapons of mass destruction are finally eradicated from this world. We will build that world. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Thank you. question of workers' control and he spent quite a lot of time working extensively on the development of industrial strategy and in this he worked closely for a long time with our next speaker, Hilary Wainwright. Welcome Hilary. about uh, he encouraged us and, and, and moving into, which other people have done too, into the question of power because in a way it wasn't just about his, his avuncular, well, we all love it, would have loved him as our uncle or our father, but you know, it was also about power and uh, Mohamed Maboub from the Ghana strike illustrated that by talking about how Tony came and encouraged them. The end result of that was a massive shift in the balance of power, so the struggle was actually won and spread. And in a way, taking this key commitment of Thomas that he got into the uh, 83 manifesto about a fundamental shift in the balance of power in favour of working people and their families, what was underpinned that was the idea of struggling and supporting people, working people, in their struggles for power. So, as Owen's just Said, it wasn't about power from above, it wasn't about giving out power, it was about providing support and encouragement for the development of that power. And that's what made him so dangerous. And that's what I want to just briefly reflect on in his work around industry. Because in a way, he, his, his background, as everybody knows, came out of not just a sense of frustration with you know, the civil servants and the elite and all the sort of you know, uh, paraphernalia of quasi-medieval feudal power that makes up the British state, when he was trying to um, you know, drive the modernisation, you know, when he wasn't particularly a socialist, but he, he just wanted to drive a real modernisation that would be in the interest of working people, of British industry under Harold Wilson, and was incredibly frustrated. But at the same time, and this was the key thing, he was inspired and, and transformed by becoming involved in and observing the uh, occupations and the workings of workers like those at the UCS shipyard on the upper climb, where he could see that the, um, the commitment to industry, to technology, to using skills and, and machinery for the benefit of all and, and maintaining um, industry and, and, and the development of, 
of, of industry and jobs. Uh, lay with our energy and commitment, lay with the workers, lay with working people against the sort of short-term profit-oriented uh, interests of management. And in a way, that, that understanding, that commitment to the energy and creativity of workers is what then, in a way, he brought with him into the, the Department of, of uh, Industry, uh, of which he was minister. And that's what, um, that's what scared the shit out of people uh, like the city, like actually part of the Labour government and some of the trade union leadership. But I just want to give a, a whiff of that from, by reminding people of an entry in his diary, which is just very sort of symptomatic. The diary records that on Thursday, the 27th of June, the Department of Industry's permanent secretary, Sir Anthony Part, or maybe he wasn't Sir then, but he became so for his um, you know, um, contribution to the establishment. He came up as a sort of message boy of that establishment into Ben's office uh, after seeing that Ben had made a speech in which he, Ben, had attacked industrial policies that quote discussed uh, policy in the comfortable atmosphere of Westminster, Whitehall and Fleet Street, and in which Ben urged wider regional and worker participation, I in which Ben encouraged people. Uh, and, and Sir Anthony Part said, um, you're inflaming people, you're raising the temperature. This is what encouraging working people meant to the establishment. Ben then takes up a story. He said, not at all, I'm using very clear language. I said, uh, Tony said, I went and, and he went over and opened the Labour Party manifesto and, and read it out to Anthony Park, saying the first objective of the manifesto is about a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power in favour of working people and their families. I read, he said. Well, said Anthony Park, there are, I've never known a minister in the whole course of my life, and this guy was, you know, being civil servant for donkey's years. I, I've never known a minister in the whole of my life, in any party, who's been like you. I who's had the cheek to actually expect civil servants to, to implement the manifesto, which was the mandate on which you know, he was there as a minister. Um, and the thing about, about Tony was, it wasn't just, it was in a way, been an implicit agreement around Labour the governments coming into office, that they, you know, all the rhetoric about socialism and so on is kind of allowed once it's understood that once in office, you know, the civil servants will, will, will determine what's feasible. And in, in a way, Tony, it wasn't just that he, he believed in his rhetoric, he believed passionately in the capacities of working people, but that he actually turned that into practice. I mean, all that, um, all the, all that sort of commitment to practicality that often comes out in discussion about his love of gadgets, actually, it was just about wanting to get things done. So his immediate instinct was not to sort of ring up the trade union leadership, but to contact the shop stewards, the people that actually knew how the industry was, what was run. You know, he didn't want to rely on management, but he needed inside knowledge. And that knowledge came from the shop floor, the designers, the engineers. And that's when he invited into his office, much to the shock of people like Sir and Part, who were just completely, you know, feeling that the guy was beyond control. And by all those notions of him being mad and so on, come just simply from the fact that he, he would encourage workers, he would encourage working people. He got them into his office and asked them what they wanted to do with Lucas Aerospace. He had the power to nationalise it. Is that what they wanted? And they went back to their shops to his Conway Committee. This was a period of immense confidence and, and, and capacity uh, in the, in the Labour movement to the shop floor. I read, uh, listened to a tape of the meeting and you could see the consequence of that encouragement, that, that meeting that, in which he would be encouraging them. And it wasn't just that they felt, you know, good, they felt encouraged. That infused in them a sense that they could do it. They could go back to their members and draw up a plan for what their, um, their skills, their machinery could be used for. And the, the, there's a time I can't quote, but the kind of quotes that come out of that tape are things like, you know, if we do it on management's terms, you know, we're just cutting our own throat, we must do it on our own terms, and we can do that. We've got the capacity, we've built the combine committee, we can do our own, um, yeah, we can do our own sort of plan. And so that, but then he didn't just simply invite people to his office, he went out, he went out to Tyneside, for instance, 
with where I worked with the shop stewards. And the effect of his encouragement there was they drew up a plan for workers' control with management participation. And then he worked with the Institute of Workers' Control to develop an organisation that would, that would um, actually develop this whole notion of popular control from below. So in a way, you can see why he was vilified. This, you know, he was dangerous. This was serious stuff. And it's no wonder that, that he was, I mean, it's completely unjustified because he was just extending democracy against the dictatorship of the workplace so that, it, you know, there was nothing sort of, you know, kind of illegitimate about this. It was completely logical. Okay, so just finally, to end, he then drew lessons from that about the kind of Labour Party that was needed to give expression to that power. And that's where he set up the Chesterfield Conference that I worked on with him and Ralph Miliband. And I suppose what I want to end by saying is that, in a sense, therefore, this whole notion of um, he encouraged us must be understood as a, a kind of key idea, a key, a key strategic idea that we must take with us. And in that sense, you know, his absence it is to be more, but he get left us with a strategic idea for a, a kind of socialism that really could be popular, that depends on us encouraging people, supporting people, because the people have got that capacity to, to build a different kind of society, and that must be our, our way of turning that uh, legacy into a living, a living impetus, a living strategy. So, sorry to leave the great range of campaigning organisations that Tony supported and one of those was War on Want and so it's a pleasure to welcome their director this evening. Please welcome John Hillary. Kate, thank you so much. It is really a great privilege and a pleasure to be able to join in this tribute to Tony Benn this evening. And as you say, he was a man who really gave an enormous amount to our organisation, to War and Want, over the years. It is a pleasure, but I must say, it's a bit difficult as you find the evening going on, thinking, oh gosh, what am I going to be able to say? People haven't already said if you're the 38th speaker, and also you're getting evil views from the chair even before you start about keeping the time. But, but I am really, really glad to be able to speak because there is one aspect of Tony's life which perhaps hasn't been covered in the depth that it really, really demands. And that was his internationalism, not just in an abstract way, but an anti-imperialism. An anti-imperialism that stemmed from that stemmed from his own experience. We heard about that in the short film at the beginning. His experience in the Second World War in Africa, seeing that the privileges that we enjoy in the rich North have been based on 500 years of colonial oppression. And that he, as part of that great anti-colonialist generation after the war, stood up for the rights of all, said an injury to one anywhere in the world is an injury to all. And he fought alongside the other greats like Fenner Brockway for the creation of an anti-colonial movement. And then in 1964, with the Labour government coming into power, formed the first Ministry for International Development. So for us at War and Want, that really is the strongest part of his legacy. Seeing internationalism at the heart of everything we do, joining up our struggles here with struggles across the world as part of one global struggle. That is the message, justice for all, anywhere across the world. And it's actually something I've gone back to with the European elections just a couple of weeks back. As you see this nasty, racist message coming through from UKIP and then permeating all of the other parties. And Tony Benn was absolutely clear on his position on Europe. He said, I am a Democrat and I am worried about the powers which are being taken by Brussels. But I am absolutely convinced that this is nothing to do with the peoples of Poland or Italy or Spain or Greece. This is about the powers of capital taking away our freedoms in the name of profit. And it's not to be used by But 
we are here also on an anti-war platform. We saw the fantastic film that Amir has produced in relation to the 2003 demonstrations. But the one thing I wanted to remember was actually from the first Gulf War back in 1991. It was a moment which for me encapsulated what Tony Bennett really left as his legacy. And that is an understanding of being able to look beneath the surface and make sense of things. I don't know if you remember this, but it was at a time when it was, it was for the first time ever really, you got the pictures of Scud missiles being sent in from warships outside Iraq, and they were going down the main streets of Baghdad with BBC journalists almost tracking them to their deadly targets. And I remember seeing this on news nights, and it was almost as if it was mesmerizing for the journalists. This was the first time that we were able to bring you war on TV. And they showed you explosion after explosion. They showed you death after death. And it was Tony Benn who said, stop. We must not make a spectacle of other people's disasters. We must not make a spectacle of war and injustice. Turn those cameras off and let's debate why we're doing this. Let's debate whether it's any way a right thing to do. And let's call back to some form of sense and reason the politicians who've done this supposedly in our name. And for me, that is what Tony Benn has The ability to see the new things, the ability to ask the difficult questions, the, the ability to get up the nerves of the establishment media and the establishment politicians, that's what made him awkward, that's what made him great, that is his legacy to us, and we must continue it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. This evening could go on forever, but it won't, unfortunately. There's three more speakers and then some, then some music. But before that, I just want to quickly say this. Stop the War Coalition was founded and led, led and inspired by Tony Benn. It exists because there is an ever-present danger of war. And I want you just to thank everyone that's worked so hard to stop the War Coalition over all these years and put on tonight's event. Said, there was a huge understanding of the world by Tony Benn. And uh, I'm Chair of Liberation. He was there at the founding of the movement for colonial freedom with Fenner Brockway and many others. He took up the cause of the injustice done to the Mau Mau people in Parliament. He took up many causes in the 50s when it wasn't so easy and wasn't popular at all. And the last point I make before I call our next speaker is this. We've had a message from the Greek Solidarity Campaign this evening. Tony was its president. Paul Matney cannot be here this evening. And he's asked me just to convey this message. The people of Greece are undergoing a new experiment in neoliberal economics. They're seeing their health service, their education service, their social services decimated on the altar of neoliberal economics imposed on them by the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund. They saw in Tony somebody who understood that and opposed the IMF when it tried to derail the Labour government in 1977 as somebody who understood their plight and their cause and they said sorrow at his death, mourn his passing but resolve to defeat neoliberalism in his memory. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, Jim Thomas, family, speak to us, Jane. towards the end of a meeting, because by that time you've scratched out most of the things you were going to say. But the very first thing I want to say is something that Tony said and was quoted on right at the very beginning on the film. And it was about this thing about being a national treasure, which quite clearly is a way of trying to diffuse the ability of somebody to be threatening. And I happened yesterday to be reading my diary, which you believe, 2008. I mean, it's not quite the same sort of diary that he has, but it's a pretty good one. I doubt it will be published, but certainly not in my lifetime. But anyway, I was reading it, and I found a quote from a woman called Emma Jacobs. And this is in 18th of September, 2008. And she writes, it's in the FT. Everything is upside down. 
I no longer even know what constitutes a national treasure. When I was a child, it was the Queen Mum. Then last night, it was two tissue paintings, the quite clearly they were trying to save the nation. And now Hank Greenberg, formerly AIG chair, that was the big insurance firm that went down, says, it's a national treasure. Letting AIG go down would be a tragic mistake. Now, the problem is that for me, when talking about Tony Ben, you know, you can hear people plugging around about it's a national treasure. And I just think it's something that, in a sense, he is. He's ours. I loved this man. And all of us loved him in lots of different ways. Clearly, quite clearly, all the people around Stop the War, all the people around things like, for example, all the movements that he identified with, all the trade unions, didn't just respect him. They loved him. And in a way that I don't think we do with many other political figures. And thinking about it, there is one person that I think has been half mentioned by, by a minister at the beginning, and occasionally by others, but I think it's somebody who should be talked about very briefly, and that's Carolyn, his wife. And I knew her because she was somebody who was at Holland Park School, who's a governor of Holland Park And she was one of those women who immediately you respect. She was very, very bright. She was very beautiful. She was very calm. She wasn't overpassionate about things. She didn't swear. She didn't argue too much with people. She was immensely calm and immensely powerful in that sense. And on the governing body at Hong Park, which was stuffed full of either right-wing Labour, a few of them, or the Tories who were running against and Chelsea at the time, she was a force to be reckoned with. And at one point, one of these uh, uh, governors turned around and said that he thought we should have an officer to get cadet training courses, you know, for the school. And it was Karen who just demolished him. And the reason I want to talk about her is because I think in many ways she was one of the most important influences on Tony's life. She was there as a socialist. I mean, they, what Tony did after her death, and it was a terrible sort of period of three or four years when she was very, very ill. And he was completely sort of, you know, really hurt by that, I think, in terms of what he was watching. But at the end of her, uh, well, after she died, he then insisted on having a red flag put up on their house in Notting Hill. And on his set, author, teacher, and socialist. And that's what she was. And in many ways, I think the same thing could be said about him. Author, teacher, and socialist. And it could have been his name as well as hers. But he, there are, a very good thing, I mean, Melissa did mention this test tube with uh, some sort of rust in it. Well, I was actually, I'd asked Tony to come to Hong Park, and I insisted on a three-line whip for every single sixth woman to come and listen to him talking about being an MP. And the very first thing he did was he put on the sort of table in front of him this test tube, and I said to him, what's in there? Is it rust? And he smiled very quietly and then explained that he'd had it taken out just before he lost his, you know, his uh, Lord Stanley position, and in order to show that in fact it wasn't blue blood. And I tell you, the kids in that room were absolutely transfixed. And I think that's one of the things about Tony that I've always, always loved about him. Whichever audience, whether it's, I mean, it was what Sam said about very small children, whether it's little children, whether it was adolescents, whether it's people who, in fact, are pensionistas like I am, or whether it's a mass of working people or whoever, he always talked in a way that you wanted to listen. Because he was always talking about something that would be possible, that ought to be possible, that ought to be denied now, and we ought to be living for a different sort of future. And the very last thing I would say is, he's not somebody who went to the theatre very often. But I decided we should go and see uh, Jack Shepard's play called Holding Fire. And it was a play that was on at the Globe in 2007. And it was a very baggy play, about three hours long. 
And if anybody's been to the Globe, it's impossible to sit there for three hours. They're on little benches, and Tony was sitting next to me. And I could he feel him sort of falling asleep every now and again on my shoulder. <laughs> but as the thing was going on, I, uh, I realized that this was about a play about the Chartists. And I said to him, will you talk at the end of the play? And he said, of course he would. And I rushed around to the back of the stage, and I said to Tom and uh, Drumgold, who was in fact the director there, I said, Tony Benn is in the audience and wants to make a statement at the end of the play. And after the cast had lined up, and we're all taking their bows, Tony went forward, and we can all see him, because we've all seen him doing this, frailly getting up the steps onto the stage, and turned around to the Globe Theatre, the whole of the audience and the cast, and talked about the ban that Stop the War had in fact just been issued. The following day, we were going to march down Whitehall, and the very act of Parliament, which in fact Tony wanted to write, talk about at that moment, was in fact an act that had been passed to stop the Chartists. And he spoke immensely eloquently at that moment, and just said to everybody very calmly, I think that as many people as possible should come to the demonstration and we should contest the ban. And Lindsay reminded me that that next morning he turned up with his medals on his coat and of course what happened? Because there were so many of us and because it was so embarrassing, the police let us through. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jay, an absolutely incredible. Tony's internationalism was universal and he supported all peoples in struggle. What could be more appropriate than to have Sarah Colborn, Executive Director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, to speak to us now. is missed by so many of us. And when I talk about leadership, it's for him, he took positions on issues that were not easy. He, as Ismail said, um, spoke out in favour of boycott of Israeli goods in 2002. This is before the call came from the Boycott National Committee in Palestine. He called for an arms trade ban in 2002. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people have followed that call, but he stood out um, as a principled man of conviction, um, standing for the Palestinian cause. I just want to focus on one of the many, many times he spoke out of Palestine, and that was a time that I'm sure you'll all remember. Uh, which was uh, when he lambasted the BBC for their refusal to broadcast the humanitarian appeal for Gaza. And this was the first time the BBC had rejected a disaster emergency committee appeal. And he went on the BBC, and I'll just quote one paragraph from what he said, the decision of the BBC to refuse to broadcast a national humanitarian appeal for Gaza is a betrayal of the obligation which it owes as a public service. He didn't mince his words. And he talked about the human suffering that all of us had seen. And he talked about how horrified and appalled people were that the BBC were refusing to give that humanitarian appeal a chance to air. And in that three minutes, which you can all see um, on YouTube, millions of people have seen it on YouTube, he twice read out the address um, and the phone number for people to donate. So, <laughs> Tony was loved because of his consistency, his principles, and because he cared, he inspired us all to struggle for a better future. And he was a true internationalist. He understood the importance of solidarity. And he understood the importance of all of us of campaigning here for change. And 
I was in Turkey last weekend um, for the commemoration four years on from the attack on the Nabi Marmara. And even there, people were saying to me how honoured they were to have had the chance to have met Tony on a demonstration. And that's how most of us will remember Tony leading demonstrations, speaking at rallies, inspiring us all, encouraging us all. He spoke out of Palestine so many times, um, at Palestine Solidarity Campaign events in the Labour Party, in Parliament when he was a Labour Party MP. He spoke out for peace, for human rights, for international law, and against occupation and oppression. And Tony showed us all that we have the ability to organise to make a difference. He showed the power of hope, determination, and encouragement. And tonight, as we celebrate his life, this event is also about building on his legacy. He's left us with some incredible inspiration, tools, and the hope and love that we need to continue this struggle. I think Tony did not know when he said he wanted the words he encouraged us on his tombstone to know how many millions he actually encouraged and how many millions he actually touched uh, with the work that he did. So he did encourage all of us. Thank you, Tony. What could be more appropriate than that? And our last speaker, before we conclude with some music, is Sami Ramdami from Iraq, who stood and marched with Tony, stood for democracy and freedom in Iraq, and stood against a war against Iraq, but Sami is a man that stands for peace and stands for principle. Please welcome Sami Ramdami. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I'm here tonight really because I owe a debt of gratitude to Tony, to Tony Benn as somebody who was born in Iraq. And I think the Iraqi people owe him a debt of gratitude because he stood by the Iraqi people not only when the imperialists tried to bomb Iraq to the Stone Age and destroy Iraq in the last war, but also he stood by the Iraqi people over many decades dating back to the 50s and 60s. He stood against oppression, against dictatorship. He stood for real democracy in Iraq. When he was with the Iraqi people, the Western media here, the successive British governments, both Tory and Labour, unfortunately, supported the dictators. And when it came to imperialism wanting to launch a war against him, the Iraqi people, he was there in the front line defending the Iraqi people and opposing imperialist wars. He was a man of principle, that's why we owe him a huge debt of uh, gratitude. <laughs> I got to know Tony a bit better during the various uh, meetings, anti-war meetings, and I tell you one little story I, I had with him. He often used to uh, uh, come out a little bit of the meetings, either before or after. Um, and he had his rucksacks at a meeting at Conway Hall a few years ago. And I noticed he was going to sit on the rucksack. He actually asked me could he sit down. And he uh, explained to me uh, a bit about his rucksack. He actually converted his rucksack into a chair to sit on. And he told me that he might even patent it and raise money for the movement. <laughs> it, it, it was an ingenious contraption with uh, bits of metal sticking out and so on, and I hope his family would keep that, uh, that rucksack. It shows his indomitable spirit of optimism, of doing things, and not just talking about them. Uh, a man of principle indeed. And I think the greatest compliment paid to, to Tony uh, Ben came from one of his uh, arch enemies, political enemies, Harold Wilson, former Prime Minister. He was trying to belittle uh, uh, Tony Ben uh, and attack him, and he said that Tony Ben immatures with age. And I think that is a great compliment because, uh, because, because Tony Ben uh, improved. Uh, 
refused to climb the greasy pole. And when he reached to the cabinet office, he realized that two things he realized. Capitalism is not reformable and socialism has to be fought for, but he also became a staunch fighter against imperialism. And I think if you want to call a left wing of the Labour Party, then it has to be called the anti-imperialist wing. And I'm glad that Jeremy Corbyn is holding that talk today in Parliament. And I think Jeremy is a worthy uh, a holder of that torch because he is also a consistent anti-imperialist and a fighter for working class rights. Thank you very much. Very, very much for those of you who've, uh, who've lasted the whole thing. As usual, it's like the demonstrations, we have we put too much on the agenda, but that's because there's so many people have so much to say about Tony. And when the minister spoke earlier and said that we're really going to miss him as a family, of course, we all understand that grief, but I think there's a much wider group of people who will miss him very much. I'll miss him as a friend and a, a campaigner, and I'm sure all of us do have our own memories in different ways. But there's two events that I've been missing very much. The first is on the 21st of June, when the People's Assembly demonstration against austerity is taken to the streets of London, and Tony won't be there. And we will all be there, I hope we'll build it as big as possible, to show for his memory that we are committed to all the things that he was campaigning about. So I hope everybody can join us on that day. It's about fighting against war and about austerity. The second is that NATO is coming to Newport in South Wales at the end of August, beginning of September for a summit. Uh, we know what that's about, more NATO expansion, more new wars, all the other things that they've been planning for so long. Again, we know that Tony would have been there. We can't have him with, with us there now, but we can all be there, we can be building this event, and we can be doing everything we can to build the movement against austerity and against war. So thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, Jeremy's just going to say a few words and then we'll have a couple of songs from Julie Felix. And then, the last word of the evening, after all of us, was two things. One, please leave by this exit and please put your hands in your pocket if you can. But the last word, after Jeremy, after Julie Felix, will be from Tony himself. So just sit there for half a minute longer. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Josh has stayed throughout. Thank you, Josh. And pass on to the family. This is Tony's other family. This is a huge one, and we'll never forget him. So pass on our love and affection for him. And when Lindsay said that NATO are there spending a lot of money, Obama's just announced another billion dollars to boost NATO funds. I remember Tony once saying, there's always money for wars, there's never enough money for houses, schools, and hospitals. It should be the other way around. And in his memory, let's make sure it is the other way around. Can I ask you to welcome I wanted, there's lots of things I wanted to say about Julie Felix, fantastic singer, fantastic musician, but she wanted to be introduced as fellow marcher with Tony Benn, Julie Felix. Thank you. I'm just waiting for a microphone. Uh, well, they, while he's doing that, I just want to say that um, I've been marching for 50 years now. I started in 64, and every time when Tony Benn was there, it was like Superman arrived, because he was my superhero, and I felt safe when he was there, and now I really, really am going to miss him so much, because uh, there's nobody that I feel quite as safe with as I did with Tony Benn, so I'm going to try to sing for him tonight. Build 
that hide behind the walls, you that hide behind the next.
the thank you my father, my mother and father, and my two brothers, and above all Caroline, who inspired me in the 50 years of our marriage, and my children and grandchildren, and all the many, many other people who supported me in the of me and taught me so much. And I hope that it will turn out the marriage then, and that I didn't give offence because I tried to speak my mind, and that's what you have to do in politics. So thank you very much. And I'll set that on the <laughs>